Let's just jump right back into it with another part within my vinyl collection. This is now part 26 of this series. Finishing up the K's and going to start the L's within this. Only other thing to talk about here, and I don't really want to spoil it, but I'll just mention it really quick. The next couple of videos are actually going to be very special, uh, at least for me anyway, that I can't wait to uh, share with you guys what it's all about. Other than that, there will be a contest in the very, very near future, and I don't want to spoil the surprise, but I will say one of the hints for it are right on the screen right now. Other than that, what's going to be playing in the background is going to be a blackened grindcore band from India that I found out from one of my uh, friends over online called Heathen Beast. Really, really good. Very similar to that of a Nolithrock or, you know, just really crazy, hectic, harsh, extreme metal that I feel like just, you know, again, those adrenaline junkies that look for nothing but just fast, chaotic music can definitely find some enjoyment with Heathen Beast. Starting off part 26 is going to be the sixth full-length album by Korn, Take a Look in the Mirror. If you know me personally, this is such a crime in my view that this is the only Korn album that I own. Because from the ages of 13 to 17, Korn made up a humongous portion of my playlist growing up when I was a teenager and I've always just been such a fan of them and to this day still I have a very you know big soft spot for them because I think of my adolescence and the nostalgic trip I have when listening to their albums but I mean I've always enjoyed their approach with new metal mainly because Jonathan Davis's vocals were always signature to me and Field Lead's bass playing, how he does the slap bass where it sounds like two chains smacking against each other, is just so impossible to ignore it because what I've noticed when you listen to Korn from the 90s all the way to the early 2000s, when you tend to bop your head to their music, you're not bopping your head to uh, the drumming done by David Silvera, you're bopping your head to Field Lee's bass playing because it's just so thick that it sounds like percussions more than just a bass. And that's something that's always been such a standout about Korn. And I need to get more by them because this is the only album I have. And I need to get Issues, which has always been my personal favorite. Follow the Leader, which is the fan favorite because it kind of broke them into mainstream success. Life is Peachy, the self-titled debut, and Untouchables. All that I would love to own. Everything past this album... <laughs> it ranges from okay to just terrible because their album Path of Totality is like a crime against humanity when they went like full on dubstep new metal. That <laughs> so bad. But this album, I would say within everything in their discography, is probably the most aggressive and heaviest because Jonathan Davis does more of his harsher vocals within this album. Uh, Field Lee's bass playing just seems, you know, faster and more aggressive. The guitar tone is still as thick and sour sounding. Just everything within this album just screams heavy aggression for, again, corn standards. Tracks in here like Right Now, Break Some Off, uh, Did My Time, Everything I've Known, Let's Do This Now. Just all just angsty, aggressive, you know, teenage monster energy drink fueled new metal that I've always had such a soft spot for. Another standout track is the track, um, Y'all Want a Single. And while the songwriting is insanely basic, and all he really does is repeat the phrase or uh, chorus, Y'all Want a Single say, fuck that, like, over and over again. I think they cuss, like, 98 times, which I got so bored as a teenager once I counted every time they said the word fuck. I think it, you know, equaled out to, like, 98, which is weird how I still remember that. But anyway... The context behind that song, from what I remember, is the record label wanted them to have a single attached with this album to help them sell it better. And they didn't want to do that, but the record label insisted that they do because of contracts, blah, fucking blah. So, <laughs> Y'all Want a Single is basically like a lazy middle finger to the uh, record label corporation for making them uh, do a certain thing when writing music, from what I remember uh, hearing about that song. But... Anyway, a lot of you guys should already know this because either you enjoy it for the nostalgic trip or you hate it because everyone talks about it. But anyway, as for the layout packaging with this album, 
You have album artwork, backside with the track listings. Comes with an insert sheet with a band photo and credits on the other side. The LP variant is double LP and it comes on this silver gray type of variant. Up next is going to be Conflict with their debut full length album, Trigger Universal Conflict. Just realizing now my mistake as conflict starts with a K-O-N and corn is K-O-R, so we need to fix that when uh, rearranging my record collection. But anyway, conflict is a war metal band based out of Sri Lanka. And one thing that really surprises me about that small country with the uh, tiny metal scene that it has is that a majority of those bands are like war metal bands that just have this very obliterating sound to them. And conflict is... You know, it still carries a lot of the components and styles of that of war metal, but they really have a more focus of that on power electronics when kind of, you know, incorporating it with their war metal sound. And it just sounds like that's something equivalent to like an airstrike just happening over and over again. Like this is just the musical equivalent to an airstrike is how I can best summarize conflict and it's just absolutely obliterating that, again, not crazy for war metal, but Conflict makes it very interesting. I'd love to get more by them, but as you can see with the uh, Obi strip, as you could probably guess, it's uh, quite hard to get it. But, uh, yeah, other than that, if you're just an adrenaline junkie like uh, Revenge, Tetragrammicide, Nyaka Blitz, you'll definitely find something to enjoy with Conflict. As for the layout and packaging, however, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, as well too comes with an insert sheet with lyrics and it's just on a standard black vinyl. Proceeding on next to the debut album by Kreetog. These guys are a Japanese cross-punk band that obviously take a lot of influence from bands like Doom, uh, Discharge, and Gizm. If any of those bands appeal to you, you'll definitely enjoy Kreetog. And overall, this is the kind of cross-punk that I personally enjoy. Just actually, I should say punk music in general, where it's just very fast, loud, abrasive, and obnoxious from start to finish. That at some parts of it, with the guitar playing, it reminds me a bit in some ways of that of speed metal in some aspects. That I feel like bands like this within punk can really appeal more to metal fans, which I guess is why I really enjoy this album for what it is. It's very fast, very abrasive and just quick and right to the point as I think this album's only like 20 some odd minutes long so it's really quick and fast but yeah right down here it says play loud and die which is the perfect way to summarize uh, this album and it sucks this is the only thing I think they've ever released in terms of full-length albums everything else is like EPs and demos that are kind of hard to get but thankfully this album is really easy to find on Discogs I think I only paid like 10 bucks for it so definitely worth the price this was also put out through uh, La Vida S on Mus which hopefully I'm saying somewhat right and what I like about their packaging and layout is that the uh, jacket stock they use for the jackets are very heavy duty and thick so you definitely get your money's worth out of that as for the layout and packaging however you have album artwork backside with the track listing and more artwork comes on a standard black vinyl however it does have a printed inner sleeve with a band photo on one side and lyrics on the other then i have krieg's machine with their album enemy of man this is a polish black metal band that has members of mcgua and Easily, this has their best material they ever wrote as musicians. Whereas Magua, I've noticed the members tend to have more of a straightforward approach with their writing of black metal that's very solid and seems to have won over a lot of people. Creek's Machine, however, I feel like they experiment with how they write black metal and it's easily some of the most creative stuff they've ever done. And one thing I absolutely love about Creek's Machine is the drumming on any album you check out by them is just sheer brilliance, simply put. Because it's not just, you know, endless blast beats or, you know, 4-4 four, four types of drumming being played. It's very creative. It's something that is, I guess you could say, very meticulous how it's laid out, but still doesn't lack any power. It's creative, but it isn't pretentious. And somehow it fits with black metal when so many bands go for the stripped down straightforward approach. Krieg's Machine has more creativity with the drumming that is just so incredible. 
and the drummer for Creed's Machine, as long as as well as Mavoie too, super talented. There's no way of denying that. And how I've always looked at this album, and a lot of people I talk to kind of agree agree with me on it, is that Creed's Machine is what Behemoth thinks it sounds like. Creed's Machine plays what Behemoth sounds like, and it is so so good. The track on here, Lies of the Father, is hands down my favorite song on here. Other great tracks are Farewell to Grace, Ascending in Passion, and the title track, Enemy of Man. So, so good, well-creative, well-written black metal that uh, should not be ignored. And I was so stoked to see that they finally did a repress for this, because it's put up through, yeah, No Solace, um, which is the label that um, is ran by, I think, one of the members of McGuaw. So if you want it, go to No Solace, because they did represses for it. As for the layout packaging for this album, you have Almar Orc, backside with the track listings. Once again, on a standard black vinyl, along with a printed inner sheet with artwork on one side and lyrics on the other. Oh boy, now for some sketch within this final collection part series. Next up is going to be Crystal Knock, War Spirit. This is a one-man black metal project based out of France that I know for a bit was inactive during like the 2000s around that time because if memory serves me right the member behind this uh, LF that guy went to jail and I'm not sure if it has something to do with hate speech but it had, I know it co-aligned with his radical right-wing views and I think it was hate speech the last time I searched it up but yeah, he's active with it again, but hasn't done really anything with it other than do a repress for War Spirit that was put under uh, Azrar. So if you want copies, I think Azrar might still carry them. But as for the overall songwriting, it's just really stripped down, basic, straight to the point, raw black metal that you know is very aggressive and riff heavy. However, the one standout feature with it that I really enjoy is that. Um, the keyboards utilized within it give off a very melodic edge that uh, just gives out some standout features with it. But other than that, not really much else to say. So um, yeah, if you want some pretty good raw black metal that's really straightforward and right to the punch, definitely check out Crystal Knock. As for the layout and packaging, however, this is a special edition which I'll talk about in a second as to why it is. But you have Almar Orc, backside with the track listing. As I stated a second ago, it was the special limited edition that I scored. And Azrar at the time screwed up with it, which I've noticed like a lot of the early releases by Azrar tend to have fuck ups. So either it's going to be a certain color, then it turns out black, they do special editions, and it just becomes standard. So Azrar at the beginning of this label had a lot of uh, missteps, and this is one of them right here as well because it comes with this kind of like apology sheet telling everyone that hey you know it was supposed to have this it was supposed to have that but you know we were kind of rushing doing this so it, it they kind of cut out a lot of the content that was supposed to be within it but you know it does come with a patch of uh, crystal knock as well too a poster of the album artwork and this vinyl edition is the limited variant that's i think limited to like 20 copies on white hmm wonder why. Taking on next is going to be Kvelgeish, I think that's the right way to say it, with their debut soul release they've ever done. Kvelgeish is a black metal band from Switzerland that's a part of the Helvetic Underground Committee, and it has members, obviously, of Umfeld. And one thing I've noticed about this band, when you compare it to Umfeld, which I've noticed I seem to do that with every uh, Helvetic Underground Committee band, is that it's literally... Umfeld, but it's but think of it like this instead of Umfeld being from Switzerland where they have all the Swiss folklore and kind of like aesthetic they play around with it it's Umfeld from Finland because it has like a strong finish of black metal vibe being played here with those very heavy aggressive riffs that you know again if you're aware of the style of it you can really kind of resonate with this album particularly. And uh, yeah, it won me over because a lot of the bands that are a part of the Helvetic Underground Committee just have a very infectious, just well written black metal sound. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's just overall solid and reliable. And because of that, I blind bought it and i um, really not disappointed at all with this album. So again, if you enjoy finished black metal, you'll definitely find something to enjoy with Cavell Gage. 
As for the layout and packaging, however, this was put out through Vendetta Records. And Vendetta Records, I would say, is one of the best and most uh, reliable black metal labels to check out because a lot of the bands signed to it and a lot of the records that they put out are just top-notch modern-day black metal. So definitely check out Vendetta Records. Anyway, as for the layout, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings. Comes on a standard black vinyl along with a printed inner sheet with band picture on one side and a clusterfuck of the lyrics on the other. Wow, okay, uh, this is quite the shakeup for the next uh, record to be talked about here because uh, usually I feel like I present myself in a way where I talk mainly about esoteric underground metal bands and artists and it makes up a huge portion of everything behind me within my collection but I still enjoy mainstream artists. And to some people right now, they're probably thinking, you like mainstream? That's like stuff that they spoon feed you, all right? That's nothing really that special. Here's how I look at it, and this is probably gonna get under a lot of people's skin, but it's just the cold hard truth. If you purposely uh, dislike mainstream artists because it's mainstream solely because of it, you're as much of a tool as of that of people who discredit underground bands because they're not successful and they're not really musicians. I, I look at you both the same way if you do that. Anyway, I've always enjoyed this woman's work and I need to get more by her. And I'm talking about Lady Gaga with her debut album, The Fame. In my personal view, Lady Gaga made the late, tw the late 2000s and the early 2010s her bitch because she was always talked about and she got so much success out of it. And what I always enjoyed about Lady Gaga's work is not only does she have a phenomenal singing voice, but she is super ambitious and I think kind of like the black sheep of that to all the pop divas that were uh, sprouting around during that time. Because while her influences are obviously from stuff like Cher and Madonna, what makes this album really unique for its... Uh, placement within mainstream music is that she brought disco back to the masses, all right? I mean, just the back of it, her mic, how it's a disco ball, and the overall just look of this album just screams disco when you look inside of it and everything. A lot of the musician and just overall beats within it is very reminiscent of that of disco music, and I find that to be so ambitious because, um, for a lot of years, I remember it that people thought disco was dead, and, for, and uh, during that time, people were convinced of it. Lady Gaga brought it back, and they didn't even realize it. They were just jamming out to like these big hits that had a strong emphasis on disco kind of music, and I just to me shows ambition. Another thing too about Lady Gaga that's super ambitious that I don't feel like people bring up is as I stated, she's like the black sheep of that of the pop divas during that time. And not because oh, she wore all these crazy dresses and she was such a standout at award shows how she dressed. is because look at all the pop divas during that time. There was um, Rihanna, Katy Perry, Nicki Minaj, um, Taylor Swift, Kesha, you know, all that shit. And what they would try to do is most successful artists would try to appeal to the teenagers and the angsty young uh, adults of that of like 18 to like 22. And while Lady Gaga obviously did that with her debut album as she's young and new and trying to be like the pop uh, princess diva during that time, when you go through her discography along with every other artist I just named with all their musical work, Everyone else tries to appeal still to the young audience, where Lady Gaga feels like she matured and she's still trying to make her music age with her established audience when she started out. So it feels like there's maturity with her and it just showcases that more of like a realistic approach that reflects on her as a person where others are like, yeah, I'm in my mid-30s or I'm about to crack into 40, but hey, I'm still a teenager at heart and it's just like, uh, stop doing that, that's really cringy. Lady Gaga knew how to mature with her stuff, and she was ambitious. I mean, she was also a part of like a, an award-winning, like Academy Award-winning uh, movie, I think, with Bradley Cooper. I know she got nominated. I don't know if she won anything, but she's always like ambitious and always trying to push herself where others just kind of stay in their lane until like, you know, their fame runs out. So in my personal view, Lady Gaga <laughs> is a boss-ass bitch. <laughs> Which is something I thought I'd never say on this channel. Oh, man, I'm definitely going to lose quite a bit of subscribers after that moment. But anyway, 
The Fame, uh, her debut album that again really has a lot of uh, usage of that of disco tracks in here like Just Dance, Love Game, um, Let's Have Some Fun, This Beat Is Sick, I Want To Take A Ride On Your Disco Stick, Don't Think Too Much, Just Bust That Dick, oh, such a catchy chorus, uh, Paparazzi, <laughs> Poker Face, my personal favorite song is Paper Gangsta. That is easily, out of all the tracks with her singing, the best. That is her peak of vocals. And then also the track of Boys, 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 I feel like is like paying homage to that of Motley Crue uh, song, Girls. Because I know she's always been a fan of like hard rock stuff. Again, like um, Metallica, Motley Crue. I know a lot of dumb, stupid metal websites made a big deal because she wore a Cannibal Corpse shirt. Wow! Anyway. As for the layout and packaging with this album, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, comes on a gatefold with all the lyrics, and is just on double LP plain black vinyl. I'm just realizing now that I'm saying this a lot within this vinyl collection series, but I'm going to say it here as well, yes, I finally get to talk about this band within this series because uh, their new album is only like a week away and I'm so fucking stoked you don't get it. But we gotta talk about their early beginnings, and we're talking about Lantelos with the debut self-titled album. I adore the living hell out of this band, and I'm really not a fan of black metal going down the post-black metal shoegaze route, but Lantelos does it in like the best humanly way possible, I feel like, because this is the perfect representation of being melancholic while still playing in vain of that of black metal. And the debut album by uh, Lantelos, I would say is the most black metal fueled out of everything within the discography. And what I really enjoy a lot when you look through the four full lengths thus far, is that the transition between black metal to shoegaze and post-black metal, there's a clear transition between it as each album the black metal essence evaporates and it's replaced with more of the surreal shoegaze, post-metal, post-rock, post- Black Knight and all the fucking posts, uh, sounds. But the debut album, I would say, if you want to get into Lantlos, if you're a purebred black metal fan, this is the place to start because it's easily the most aggressive. It has the most black metal usage. There are elements of shoegaze with some aspects of it. But the real standout feature for me with this album is the vocalist. I don't know his name, and he was only on this particular album, but he has like the thickest German accent on this album that, uh, I don't know, it reminds me in a way of like Rainer Ladferman, but just a sadder version of Rainer Ladferman is what the vocalist sounds like on this album, and maybe that's why I really resonate with it, but uh, such, such glorious work by Lantlos. Lantlos can do no wrong, which is why I'm so fucking stoked. It's been seven years. And the fifth full-length album by Lantlos, Wild Hunt, will be released again. You best fucking believe it, I'm doing a review for it. But again, I know I'm sidetracking again. As for the debut album with the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with track listings. This is the recent repress from 2016, put out through Prophecy. So if you want any Lantlos uh, merchandise, go to Prophecy Records. This does, however, come with an A2 poster, basically, of the artwork with the band logo at the bottom. The LP variant is on standard black, but does also have a printed inner sheet with that of the band photo right there, both Marcus and the vocalist, and lyrics on the other side. I also have the sophomore album, that being Neon. It's kind of like the fan favorite for the most part. It's my personal favorite because this is the apex climax of shoegaze black metal. This is what melancholic black metal is, just the definition of it. Every little thing is so blissful it is gorgeous whether they play aggressive on the blast beats and tremolo pick guitars and screaming play or the clean singing with the instruments that really slow down that has like almost like a this like really somber jazzy kind of uh, drumming being played it is just so creative yet so blissful and i love every nanosecond of this album another thing too to point out that people don't really realize is that yes Niche is the vocalist on this album, and for a lot of people they look at it like Niche wrote all of this. Niche is the mastermind here. Niche's overall performance is stellar. However, he's only a mouthpiece on this album. He only does the vocals. The drumming, the bass work, and the guitars are all done by Marcus. Marcus is the true mastermind behind Lantlos, and his songwriting is just top of the 
fucking line when it comes to this style, and I can't emphasize it enough. Neon is the opus, yeah, the magnum opus. I can't even talk just how much I'm like freaking out about this album. Yeah, it's the magnum opus within the Lantwell's collection and discography. But again, Prophecy should be still carrying copies of this if you want to get it. As for the layout and packaging, however, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, comes on a gatefold. This as well too does have an A2 poster of that, of the artwork. It also comes on a printed inner sheet, one side with the artwork, other side with the lyrics. The LP edition variant I got is on crystal clear LP. The last record I have by Lantlos is their latest album so far, because again, Wild Hunt is coming out within a week, which as you can tell I'm really stoked for, but anyway, the last album so far by them is Melting Sun, released back in 2014. And this is a humongous transition from this to everything before it because the black metal essence of Lantlos is completely gone. There's nothing about this that's black metal at all. Really the only thing metal about it is like some parts of it, the guitar tone is reminiscent of that of like a more post metal sound which I know for a lot of people saying post in front of something is like oh that's boring no no you get that mindset out of your fucking head when listening to this album because it has more of like a post metal shoegaze sound but it is just ultra surreal to the point that it's it's hard to believe that this is music can do this. It is so surreal and blissful as music can get, and I love it. Every moment of this album is just so, so amazing. It's it's basically like, you know, if you want to have a massage for your eardrums and soul as a itself, you listen to Melting Sun. And one thing I've noticed, maybe it's just the people I talk to, but this has kind of become like the fan favorite Lantlos album. And I'm just so eager to see, as, as you've seen within their discography, they keep doing like these minor transitions with their sound, what Wild Hunt will be from this. So, so excited for it. But yeah, Prophecy Records, I noticed recently, did a repress for this. So again, everything you want by Lantlos, you can get at Prophecy Records. But as for the layout and packaging with this, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, comes on a gatefold with more trippy artwork. Just like all the previous Lantlos albums, it does come with an A2 poster of that of the artwork, as well too a printed inner sheet with uh, artwork on one side, lyrics on the other, and it's just on a standard black vinyl. Well, believe it or not guys, we got a black metal record within this vinyl collection part. This is Leviathan, Tentacles of Horror. Now, I need to call myself out on this because it's really pathetic by me. Because in 2015 and 2016, I remember it so vividly that Leviathan was talked about non-stop. I couldn't go on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube without someone talking about Leviathan. Giving it all the appraise because Scar Sighted um, came out around that time and it was just a non-stop appraise. And because of that, I discredited uh, Leviathan, thinking that, oh, this is overhyped, I'm not going to like it, like, you know, it can't be that good, it's not even that good. I never really gave Leviathan a proper listen, until a few years later, I finally got my head out of my ass, when Leviathan's hype um, died down a bit, and I decided to finally give Leviathan a proper listen. And I noticed that people would usually talk highly of two particular albums, which were... The debut, I'm pretty sure, is 10th sub-level of Suicide, and this right here, which I'm pretty sure is a sophomore album, Tentacles of Horror. Yet, people would always say Tentacles of Horror is Jeff Whitehead at his angriest sounding. And they weren't wrong, because the opening track on here, What Fresh Hell, perfectly showcases just how miserable of an album this is going to sound off, come off sounding like. Because it's basically a depressive angry, pissed off person making depressive, angry, pissed off black metal and this album is awesome. The riffs overall just speak for themselves. It just sounds so angry and miserable and just has like this very tormented vibe to it that uh, the overall writing of it is more of like its anger and misery towards oneself instead of it being emotionally driven towards something else. It's just a very depressive album for life itself. 
and I really think it carries the spirit of like <clears throat> true black metal quite well and Leviathan is definitely one of the uh, heavy hitters of that within United States black metal but um, for the most part I think a lot of you guys know what this is this is the recent uh, 2018 repress so thankfully thanks to this repress it's not too difficult to get and I know I don't have much by Leviathan this is the only thing I own by him which is quite weird to see because usually what I've noticed about people who enjoy Leviathan is they have like every different pressing of every single record. They have like four variants of a certain record and it's just a very collectible band to say the least with all the different formats out there and all the different variants of said format. For me, I'm nowhere near going to be the die-hard Leviathan fan that has like the crescent moon tattooed on me and I'm keeping up with everything that Jeff White had posted on his social media on uh, Instagram. But for the most part, I really do enjoy Leviathan for what it is, and Tentacles of Horror is my personal favorite from what I've heard thus far. As for the layout and packaging, however, you have Almar Ork, backside with the track listings. Comes on a gatefold, double LP, both on printed inner sleeves, so side A and B is one side with lyrics, other side with artwork. Pretty sure this is the artwork used for the CD variant, all done by Jeff himself. As for side three and four, you have lyrics again on this side and a picture of Jeff on the other. And the LP variant comes on this white with red splatter. Pretty sure it's like limited to 500 copies, I think. Once again, another oddball of a record to be talked about within this part, because this is Laja Del Sella with her debut album. It's really difficult to describe exactly what this is because it's a mixture of like neo folk meets like Latin Americana music, I guess. Like, it's so hard to describe because it's like it's elements of uh, styles that I'm just not familiar with, so I really can't describe what it is exactly. But this album really stood out to me because, again, it's neo folk and it was something different. I never thought neo folk would blend Latin Americana music together because from my understanding what Neil Folk is from what you'll mainly find is it's either in the European countries where they really become very experimental with it or in the uh, Neil Folk uh, groups that in America it's more in line with that of like bluegrass and backwoods rural type of uh, areas the overall vibe of it so I never thought I'd come across a Neil Folk uh, album that blends Latin Americana music with it, and it's really quite the standout and um, quite the different oddball piece within my collection. But from my understanding of it, uh, Lasha Del Sella used to be a uh, artist that also has other albums that blend like contemporary singer-songwriter jazz music. Like I only skimmed by through a little bit of it. Sadly, she passed away in 2008, a, few, a handful of years ago. I don't know the exact date, and I don't know the exact causes for it. And this is really the only thing I know of her, but man, she has a gorgeous singing voice. Super talented when it comes to the guitars and piano work on here. And I definitely need to check out more by her, but uh, yeah, it's just never thought I'd have a, an album blend these styles together, and it's quite the standout. I'm not going to bother pronouncing any of these song titles because, you know, they're all pretty sure either Portuguese or Spanish, but uh, the album's meant to be listened to from start to finish because a lot of these tracks blend in with each other and they uh, play off each other's strengths. But yeah, definitely check this out, Lasha Del Sella. As for the layout and packaging, however, you have Al Martwar. Once again, the backside with the track listings and a photo of her. Comes on a standard black vinyl along with a printed inner sheet of that with lyrics on each side with artwork with it. Reaching the end within this part, next up is going to be Lightning Bolt with their album Fantasy Empire. Funny enough, how I found out about these guys was the time I was playing uh, <laughs> Rock Band 3, they were one of the more difficult songs to unlock. And I remember playing it and just being so mesmerized by all the crazy drum patterns that you have to play on that video game that immediately right after I looked up who these guys were and really dug a lot of the music that they play. Because it's like, 
a really thrashy, upbeat noise rock band. And what's really amazing about them is that it's only a two-piece, yet it sounds like something of that of what would take up to like five members to create the music that they do. Because it's just a bass guitarist and drums. And the really standout feature about Lightning Bolt is it all has to do, I feel like, with the drummer Brian Chippendale. This dude is quite the character, because not only is his drumming very fast and complex and just crazy sounding, but his vocal approach is just so fucking odd, which makes Lightning Bolt all the more of a standout. Because what he does, from what I've seen, is he wears a mask with all the live shows and recordings, and it's kind of like hooked up to a special kind of microphone that he gets like at certain like black marketed websites that um, it sounds like, what's the best way to put it? Like, all right, think of it like you're going to a drive-through, like to Burger King, McDonald's, or any kind of fast food uh, <clears throat> restaurant. And you hear the guy through the speakerphone, but it's like very abrasive, distorted, and it has like that sound to it, like you know what I'm talking about. That's the kind of uh, microphone that Brian uses when recording Lightning Bolt records and when he plays live. It's so weird and it adds the wacky, crazy, over-the-top, very unorthodox sound of Lightning Bolt and it's so awesome. Because I feel like if you enjoy um, all the material off of, uh, oh my god, what's that dude's name from Death Grips? Uh, Zach Hill. If you enjoy all the other uh, bands that Zach Hill was a part of that wasn't Death Grips, you'll definitely dig Lightning Bolt for the most part. Because tracks on here like The Metal East, Over the River and Through the Woods, Horsepower, Myth Master, which is my personal favorite song, it's just very energetic, crazy noise rock that honestly, it's crazier than that of most metal bands I've heard. And I need to get more by Lightning Bolt. Such a good band. Anyway, as for where you can get this, it's put out through Thrill Jockey, so if you want to get vinyl copies, go to Thrill Jockey, because they should be carrying some. As for the layout and packaging, however, yeah, Almar War backside with the track listing comes on a gatefold. Double LP both come on standard black vinyl with a printed inner sheet, both identical of that with this artwork, and nothing on the other side. Second to last is going to be Yulia Trinidad Solemn. All I can say is I am lucky enough that I own at least one thing by Yuvia. The only other thing I have is the 10-inch uh, triple OP set that was uh, Enigma, which, again, so difficult to get Yuvia records, because when they sell out, they're going to go on Discogs for triple digits, bare minimum, and it sucks. Because Yuvia, I would say, is one of the best Mexican black metal bands that is just super ethereal and atmospheric for the style that should win over any and all black metal fans for the most part. And I would love to own the other material I'm missing by them. And surprisingly, Yuvia is still active because from what I remember, Enigma was supposed to be the swan songs for the project, yet he's done like a collaboration with another band that's all influenced by that of the concept of Berserk, which is uh, fucking awesome, which I'd love to own, but again, as I stated, when it sells out, it goes for dumb money online. But Trinidad Solemn is the, I believe, second full length by uh, Yuvia, and as I stated, it is just super ethereal, atmospheric black metal, riffs that just really engulf you in this kind of like trance-inducing atmosphere. It is just top-notch black metal for the most part, and nothing but positive things to be said about Yuvia overall. As for the layout and packaging, however, with this, this was put out through Fallen Empire years ago, and sadly, Fallen Empire isn't active anymore. And what's cool about it is with the artwork, it's kind of like cut in the middle, so you have that right there within the inside of the jacket, and the printed inner sheet is of that artwork and statue, track listings on the other side. The back side of this is just a picture of Lord Vost, I believe that's his stage name within a forest, as well too a, uh, again, insert sheet with just uh, credits on this side. 
another picture of the man himself on that side and just comes on a standard black vinyl with the band logo now in the jacket of it. And the last record for this vinyl collection part is going to be Lord Mantis Death Mask. Lord Mantis is a band that blends black metal and sludge together, which I never thought this combination would work. How are you going to have like the fast, upbeat, aggressive sound of black metal with the very slow, gross, ugly sound of sludge? Lord Mantis really made it work very well with this album, as it's just very mean and ugly and just hateful from start to finish, that at times it kind of reminds me of that, of like a slower, dragged into sunlight in some cases, which that alone you won me over already, but I would say for the most part, Sludge Metal makes up the meat and potatoes of the songwriting here, and it is just very angry, abrasive, harsh Sludge Metal, and uh, maybe it's just the fact that the black metal essence of it really sells me over quite a lot. Anyway, other than that, for the layout and packaging, I'm pretty sure... Um, Jeff Whitehead did the artwork for this because it kind of looks like something he would do for the most part with like the painting of it. This was put out through New Destiny, which um, was under the license of that of Profound Lore, so really it's put out through Profound Lore. And from what I remember, I thought these guys were disbanded, but they kind of reformed like a few years later because I know, uh, sadly, I think it was the guitarist passed away or committed suicide. And I thought this band was done, but they're still active and still making music very similar to this of Death of uh, Death Mask. So definitely it's a little bit more by my part to check out from them. But Death Mask is my personal favorite of theirs. As for the layout and packaging, however, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings and band logo. It comes on a gatefold with lyrics inside and more artwork. Double LP that come on this black with kind of like some bronze, brownish splatter in the middle of it. All right guys, that's it for this vinyl collection part. Like always, everything I talked about, I'll have links to in the description below, and that is that. So like always guys, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated, and have a great day.